let's introduce our, our panel here. First of all, we got Travis Sochik. Uh, he's at the score right now. He's the MLB writer there. Uh, he used to write uh, in Pittsburgh frequently. He did Big Data Baseball. He did the MVP machine. Uh, Travis, welcome. How you doing? Good to see you. I actually have never done face to face like this. We've always done like radio together, but never face to face. Yeah, it's nice to uh, put faces to names, and yeah, it's great to be here. Really looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, and then uh, our, our good buddy Steve Gardner, I've known for 20 years. He uh, is the senior fantasy writer and reporter uh, for USA Today, Baseball Weekly. Uh, he runs Labor. If you've played any of the, the expert leagues, you know of Steve. Uh, and if if you if you play pay attention to any of the industry, you know of Steve. So, Steve, how you doing? I'm doing great, Jeff. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing quite well. I'm in my daughter's room. We're doing bathroom renovations right now down adjacent to my office. So I have a different background than I normally do. So, hey, Outstanding. I, I, I am a fan of Mean Girls, but I, it's not really my chosen. <laughs> but, uh, anyways, um, I'm excited to do this uh, panel with you guys. Uh, and I'm excited for the cause uh, that we are raising money to combat ALS. Uh, I did way back in 19 uh, in, in college. Uh, we had a, thing, a dance marathon at Northwestern and the year that I danced, uh, the fundraiser was for uh, a, a foundation to help combat ALS. So I like that we're doing this still to this day. I don't like that we have to do this, but I think we, there's been a lot of advancement. So I like that we're doing things to help on that. You almost slipped and said you went to college and confirmed in the 1900s. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, we're see also gray hair. So um, let's Travis, how did you get started? in writing writing about baseball yeah i took i don't think this route maybe exists anymore because i started off like traditional newspaper path where mm -hmm. uh, i went to ohio state and i graduated a journalism degree and then you went out and uh you know sort of like minor league baseball you went out at smaller circulation newspapers and tried to work your way up and i started out in a, in a small town rocky mountain north carolina uh very, very little pay, <laughs> but moved very far away from home for the first time. But it was a great, uh, great growing experience. And, you know, that was sort of like rookie ball. Then I went up to like Myrtle Beach, uh, then Charleston, Post and Courier. That was, I guess, my first big break where I covered Clemson athletics. But I always wanted to to work on a, a pro baseball beat. I wanted to cover sport. I, I loved it. And, uh I went up from to Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh Tribune, <clears throat> excuse me, review, and covered the Pirates during their. Uh, they had twenty consecutive losing seasons before I arrived there, and then I showed up. So I like to take credit for for breaking the streak, streak there. And then uh, I went from there to Fangraphs and Five Thirty Eight, and now I'm at the Score. Uh, so yeah, that's sort of my path to get in here. And unfortunately the, I mean, the technology disruption and just the economics have really changed uh, working in the industry and how folks break in. So I don't know that that, that, that uh, winding road to arrive here exists anymore, but, but that's how I arrived here to and to this, uh, this wonderful conversation today. How about you, Steve? Uh, did you set out to be a baseball writer all along or did you morph into it? No, it, it's, I wanted to be a play-by-play -play announcer, actually. And so, like Travis, I went to school journalism, uh, majored in, uh, in radio and TV and film at James Madison University, and worked in local radio for several years. In fact, I bet Travis and I now can talk about Myrtle Beach a little bit, because I work for a real, a real small radio station just over the North Carolina line in Brunswick County. So uh, maybe, maybe one of these days we'll get a chance to swap some stories there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and then I, I worked in local radio for, for a good while and got a break uh, working at USA Today when the internet was first becoming a thing. Um, and USA Today was starting up a website. And uh, I got into baseball. Actually, I was more into uh, football and basketball, college and pro. And I got into baseball. It was right after the strike in 94 where nobody really wanted to do baseball. And uh, I was in news and sports at usatoday.com. And the opportunity came for me to sort of take over baseball and, uh, you know, great timing. Um, a few years later, we have the home run race of 98. And, uh, and I've been kind of locked in there and doing all sorts of things, kind of stumbled into fantasy when John Hunt left um, at Baseball Weekly. And I took over for him. 
and uh, just kind of reinventing myself as as the industry reinvents itself. But uh, I've been able to stay at USA Today and and do any number of different things over all those years. Unlike you guys, I don't have a journalism background at all. Um, I, 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 I don't pretend to be one. Uh, I was studying for the bar exam when we launched Roto News, uh, which was be, ultimately came uh, Roto Wire. Passed the bar, got sworn in, never practiced. Uh, so my writing such background such as it is, is legal writing, um, which I think actually helps me. Uh, I think it made, made me more concise, uh, allowed me to get to the point better. Uh, some clarity of language helped a lot. Uh, how to structure your your essay, if you will. But I have never had to write on deadline like you guys. Uh, and that is a completely different animal. How, how what, what sort of t- techniques did you develop to, de- to be able to write, not just write well, but also write quickly? Travis, yeah, it, you want to go ahead? Sure, yeah. I did a lot of deadline writing. Not so, I mean, today I don't do it as much. Maybe like Hall of Fame, I, I turned around an analysis piece, but yeah, beat writing days uh, on a baseball beat, it's every night is a deadline. And uh, we we used to, because on election night newspaper, the newsroom used to spoil itself with like pizzas and bringing in food. And it's like, we do this every night. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, I, I, and then sort of like you learn with experience, but uh, like on typical baseball night, I would... Uh, for a game story, I would think about okay, what's three as the game's going along. I'm thinking about, okay, what are the most important developments tonight? You sh- I think the standard was like, let's try to come up with three, three sort of bullet points and build around those as you're going. And then you have the first iteration that uh, would go to the web. And then you go down to the clubhouse and come back with uh, reporting and quotes and color for the story. And, uh, but yeah, I think it's just, uh, just having that clarity on and knowing, not trying to do too much, trying to boil it down to the most important events and build around that and not uh, overwhelm yourself. Of course, there's situations where you kind of have a construct of what you think you want to write, and then the closer blows a lead in the ninth inning. You have to <laughs> delete, control, alt, delete. Uh, but yeah, it's experience based and just. Uh, like anything else in this job, you learn as you go along, and it was. Early on in my career, it was difficult. And then as you keep doing it, keep doing it, you kind of create some best practices you, you learn to follow. Uh, so that's how I, I evolved on Deadline. For me, um, starting out in radio, you had to get right to the point. You didn't have a whole lot of opportunity to develop you know, a narrative or anything like that. So um, that helped me kind of focus what was the most important thing, um, you know, covering city governments and county governments and things. When I was in radio, you had to focus on what the most important thing is. So that, that kind of helped uh, form the foundation of my writing. And, you know, when I was first starting out and writing mostly online, we didn't really have to worry about deadlines. It was it was only really because when USA Today, the website and the newspaper kind of merged their forces. um, I remember distinctly the 2010 World Series when I kind of uh, was folded in with the paper's coverage of that World Series. And I had to write a story. And all of a sudden, you know, there's a print deadline that I've got to meet. And uh, it just sort of was a new world for me. And uh, so I had to use all the skills that I they, that I had learned before, um, learned about finding the best quotes, um, which I kind of knew about from radio and, and putting those in there and then just making it make sense to get it out the door at, at deadline time. It's, it is a different animal trying to do that. And I saw, you know, firsthand some of the, the best people who were able to, um, Mike Lepresti was a, a long time, um, associated or Gannett News Service columnist was just amazing on deadline. I, I my jaw would drop watching him and some of the other reporters and writers in action um, on deadline. It's a it's a tremendous skill and one that I don't really feel like I've mastered too well. Um, I, I think one of the things to take away from that is you're not going to get a story perfect when you have to file on deadline. So just get it in as good a shape as you possibly can um, and uh, you know, kind of rely on your editors to, uh, to take out anything that's really, really horrible. And I think that carries over even to when we're doing, you know, switching from reporting to opinion pieces to analytical pieces. Perfect is the enemy of good. Uh, you know, you're, mm-hmm. you're never going to get it perfect, I don't think. Uh, especially 
you know, I, I, I have never written a book like Travis has. I mean, and I think that's a different animal because you can agonize over a book more so than you can over just an, an article or an essay of, of some sort, because there is some sort of time time frame that you're, you're working on your opinion pieces. But I, I got to imagine that uh, this happens to me that I all agonize over a particular you know opening or a particular way I want to phrase something. And that'll it, it, it can paralyze you. Do you <laughs> run into that? Yeah, I yeah, absolutely like, do. Oh, go ahead, Steve. Uh, I, I was just that I always, you know, when people ask me about writing, I say it is really hard. I mean, for me, because I love the subject matter, it's, you know, it is a labor of love to some degree. Um, but uh, it is, I, I do the same as you, Jeff. I, I feel like I'm a better editor than I am writer. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm always going to be editing my stuff the moment I put the words down, you know, every sentence. I'm going to critically look at that. And I think that is what makes the writing process a lot longer and, and maybe more laborious than most. Um, and what a shock it was, you know, when I was saying, when, when I started to have to write on deadline, it's, uh, it's tough. And um, so, yeah, it's, it, it is something that you learn to live with and just try and find what works best for you. Yeah. With uh, like with a book project or a, an enterprise story or just uh, larger projects, I've learned to just uh, don't procrastinate, uh, chip away every day. And then it doesn't become overwhelming because you don't want to be overwhelmed when you're writing. So mm -hmm. I found if you just, you know, take make that long journey, just take a few steps every day, uh, meet some goals you can realistically, uh, set some goals you can realistically uh, reach every day, that's really helpful and it becomes less less overwhelming, less stressful. And yeah, I, you don't want to try to be perfect either. I think you just want to get, uh, yeah, you just want to have something on paper or in a word file. And if you have time to improve it and iterate, that's great, but don't, uh, yes, you want to strive for excellence, but, uh, if you're trying to be perfect, that can be an issue too. Uh, so yeah, I just try to, and I let details kind of, if you can find good details, whether through reporting or what you witness, that helps kind of write itself in a way where uh, I can build around those or, or good, good quotes or uh, something you see or data analyze. Just if you can let details sort of be, be keystones to build around, I find that helpful too. But yeah, I think if you wait and you delay and then you have this huge deadline looming, that just adds to the stress. And I learned that's not a really healthy way to live. And uh, it just set those little daily micro goals and meet them. And then it becomes, then you see the progress and then it becomes easier. And uh, that's how I've, I've learned to, to meet those deadlines. I think that could apply to more than just writing. You know, I, I think <laughs> yeah. setting, setting good goals, achievable goals is, I, I think something that's a good practice in life. Absolutely. Yeah, deep deep thoughts by Jeff Erickson. All right, <laughs> no, <that's> for sure. <laughs> Moving on, but um, I, I I think it's kind of interesting to see how you guys go about it. Do you? Let's start with you, Steve. Uh, do you have like a like a routine when you get ready to start writing? Like, do you fix yourself a cup of coffee? Do you set up a certain place? Do you always have to write in the same place? Uh, what do you have a, a routine that you like to go about? I do. Um, and it's not always the same, but if I have to write a column or something, you know, if I'm doing strict reporting, you know, something breaking news or anything like that, you got to do what you have to do. Um, but if I have time, if I'm writing a column, um, I do. I think one of the things, you know, just to, to, to calm myself and focus myself, um, I feel like, and I don't want to give away too much, but uh, I feel like if I take a shower, and I'm just there where there's no distractions and I could just be somewhere with my thoughts and kind of focus on what I'm going to write about. I feel like that gives me a really good head start and a lot of ideas somehow or another. That's the best way that ideas bubble up in my head so that when I'm done, I find, you know, a comfortable environment. Um, I have a couple of places uh, at home that that I feel like I write best in. And so putting those two together and then just getting in the right frame of mind, if I'm trying to formulate, you know, some thoughts, if I don't have a topic uh, or if I'm just starting to figure out what I'm going to write about, having those things in place, 
kind of helps me get started. And, you know, uh, I think Travis was kind of alluding to when you have a blank sheet of paper, it can be very intimidating or a blank word document. Um, just getting the first things on there sometimes is the toughest part. Uh, and a few items, a few ideas, once they're down, things then can start can start flowing. Yeah, no, those are great points and thoughts. And I can work anywhere and I sometimes I have to because I have two little kids and they can be, you know, <laughs> distracting. Uh, but yeah, I'll work home office, I'll sit on the couch, I'll go to Starbucks or a local coffee place, and I can uh, or a press box occasionally. So I've learned to you know, with our headphones and AirPods can cancel out a lot of noise. So mm -hmm. I can work wherever, but uh, I do, like I go on an hour walk every day just to walk around and I'm not a runner, sort of to get exercise, but also it's a way to let kind of thoughts collect and just get away from the laptop and just go out. And I have I think there's even research that like walking around helps generate ideas or make connections Uh in your mind. So I do find that helpful and I'll think about pieces I'm writing or reporting. And sometimes then when you come back from that and sit down, uh, your, your mind has just found a way, or at least mine has to, to better organize it. And yeah, to that idea about the blank sheet of paper that can, or the blank Google sheet that can be intimidating. And I found that re, uh, I used to think uh, as writing, uh, kind of the prose and the style and reporting is separate, but I found for myself that reporting is the writing because the better, whether it's human sources or whether it's analyzing a data set, the better re better information you have, just the easier it is to uh, to write because then you have, you know what your subject is. You, here's the argument, here's what's gonna support it. And it just, uh, it just helps. So yeah, it's in part about environment, it's in part about reporting, but uh, yeah, I would say if you're struggling, if you have writer's block, go on a walk. Then right. sit so when you down. go on your walk and <laughs> you, you you come upon an idea or you come upon details of an idea you've been working on, how do you preserve that? Is there is there like, do you stop? Do you make a note to yourself on your phone or something of that nature? <laughs> so Because sometimes those can be fleeting, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah. No, I use the, uh, on my iPhone, I use the notes app a lot. So okay. to not let anything escape. And I I use the notes for a lot of things, or even fantasy baseball research. You know, yeah. if I see a good tweet, I'll send that to my notes. Uh, so yeah, I, you know, especially as we get older, you know, those thoughts will slip away more easily. So yeah, Absolutely. whether you have a notebook on your bedstand or your iPhone, it's important to uh, to capture those because they you don't want to lose them forever. You want to preserve them. But yeah, if you've if you're in Bay Village, Ohio, and you see me stop and I'm on my <laughs> phone, yeah, I might be trying to preserve something. There you go. Uh, yeah, one of the things I I try to do is I try to outline uh, as best I can, and whether it's you know main themes or you know sometimes even a detail. Sometimes it's even a line I want to make sure I keep in my piece. You know, if I if there's something that kind of cat it goes in my head like, oh, that'll be good. Let's get that in there. I'll jot that down. You know, I want to make sure that I, that that doesn't go away because you know, hey, well, I, I I I'm easily distracted. Um, you know, I'm I'm like Dory. You know, I, I just. You, ooh, there's that, you know, something shiny. Um, and I got to make sure I preserve that. So one thing I do a lot is when I write is I do try to outline quite a bit. And I think that's something I did learn from law school a little bit. And it helps me with my structure too. Yeah. How does the uh, broadcasting versus writing process, how is that different for you, Jeff? Uh, you know, I, I write less than I used to. I'm more of a talking head than I, <laughs> than I am a writer these days. And I want to, and I do the writing I do is sporadic. It's it's not regular. And I wish that's something I want to change. Um, but I've said that a lot of other times too. Uh, having that dedicated writing time for me is something that I've struggled with. Uh, and I think maybe you know, it's partially because my schedule is all over the place. Uh, but I, I think some regularity there would probably help me to become more prolific as a writer. Yeah, I'm sure there's quite a bit of carryover and uh, or even from your law background where you, yeah. even if you're on a live radio show or podcast, you want to have it organized and right. uh, capture reader attention. So I'm sure you're, you're there's a lot of carryover there in your career, I'm sure. And I'm trying to be better now about outlining organizing and podcasts and radio shows as well. Sometimes I would just wing it. Um, and that that that. 
the younger I was, the better that worked. Uh, now I, I need a little bit more framework. I've I've noticed there, and uh, lately on podcasts, I've been doing a better job of that. Well, and two, it carries over when you have you know bullet points that you want to talk about on a radio show right. or in a uh, radio appearance or whatever. Um, those same types of bullet points are things that people like to read as well. I mean, when you're reading, especially now that we're, you know, the stuff that we write is consumed not only, you know, on a desktop, a laptop, but also on mobile. I mean, those bullet points are easy to read. People like stories that you know, are, are visually easy to, uh, to see what's important. And, and I think it helps us stay focused um, you know, whether we're just starting to write something or whether we're going on the air and talking about it. Absolutely. No, uh, go ahead. Great. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a great point, Steve. And I am a big believer in this, the power of constraints, where if you have too much freedom, again, going back to the blank page, sometimes it's hard not, not just to know where to get started, but you will drift too far. And it's better to be, I think, focused narrowly on something very small and uh, dive in, dig deeply on that uh, than it is to be too wide ranging. And and I think it's not just writing. Like uh, I just wrote a piece about uh, the jewel, the classic ballparks. And part of what made them so interesting is they were confined to these city b neighborhood blocks and they had mm -hmm. to build within those or even uh, a lot of the new age performance based training. It's all about having a constraint you have to work around is a pitcher or batter and I think there is something about that, that in, in writing too, where if you have a constraint, it's easier to build around that. It, it's kind of it's uh, counterintuitive, I suppose, but I am a big believer in constraining yourself some way, whether it's limiting to what you're focusing on or, or whatnot. I love that uh, your recent piece talks a lot about the new Comiskey, old Comiskey, and how, how everything went about that. The story on the choices that they had uh, and the way, and the no, way they yeah. ultimately went are, are just amazing to me uh, because this, it could have gone so much differently and it could have been such a better experience and it just wasn't. And it, it's funny because it, it was at the start of the ballpark boom uh, and they could have been like the leaders there. And instead they have one of the most generic ballparks ever. <laughs> I know I could rant about that <laughs> all yeah. day. And, you know, Buffalo had actually uh, built uh, the first retro park that became yeah. a model same firm HOK that Camden used in Baltimore that became Camden Yards in Baltimore and Chicago. They were presented with that option to have more of the retro feel. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, there's a, uh, hopefully that's being taught in architectural and business schools and how not to go about a project. <laughs> I was, and now I was they're looking for somewhere else possibly to build a yeah. new park. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, indeed. And I lived in Chicago at the time that happened, uh, that came out too. And just, it was, when it when they first unveiled, there's it they, they the colors were wrong too. They, it was a sea of blue in their seats there, and th that's not their colors. You know, it's not there was no connection color wise to that. No connection to like most ballparks. You know, greens is like you know you like green. Green always seems to work a lot with backgrounds and things of that nature. There was this loud buzz to, in the background all all the time there. It just everything was wrong about the aesthetics there. Yeah, again constraints. You go from Old Comiskey, where I'm not saying it was perfect, but you were on top of the action, and mm -hmm. the, the last row of the upper deck was closer to the field than the, the first row of the upper deck in the new park. And again, when you uh, – the constrained environment was much more interesting, a much better place to watch a game. So, uh, yeah, give me constraints everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Ballparks, right? In. Yeah. yeah. I, I think there's something to that there. Uh, what do you do when you run into a rut? Because we've all been there. We've all been in a situation there where oh, I can't get past this. I'm having a hard time writing this. I'm having a hard time explaining this concept. Or are you just you even just draw a blank on just uh, what you want to do next? How do you overcome that? I, I think like when Travis is taking a walk, um, I think just detaching for a little bit um, mm -hmm. because the worst part is I, I feel like if I get into a situation like that, it can become a cycle uh, that feeds on itself very easily. And so being able to walk away maybe um, for just a little bit, obviously if you've got a deadline uh, that, that makes it more difficult. 
but um, just being able to detach for, for, for a bit um, sometimes helps. Uh, looking for a different angle, perhaps, might be another way to uh, to get at that. Or, you know, if I'm stuck at a certain point in a in a column or what I'm writing, I might just leave that alone for a while and go to a different part. You know, if you have an outline and you have it divided up into three parts or four parts or whatever, just say, I'll get that later and then work on something else. A lot of times I've found that the part that I'm stuck on maybe isn't as important to the entire thing as the rest of the piece. And the easiest thing in, to do is just highlight it and delete it because it, it doesn't really add as much. So um, I try not to get too bogged down in that sort of thing because it's wasted effort. And it, it can be, you know, your, your effort can be used maybe somewhere else uh, more effectively. Yeah, I guess I'd take an even longer walk and, uh, and come <laughs> back. But yeah, there, but to Steve's point, I think that's even like a test kind of taking strategy where you don't want to spend too much time on one question if you're if it's a real roadblock for you, you want to revisit it. Uh, I also try to have two something on the front burner, something on the back burner. I like to have kind of two projects going on at the same time. So if I'm stuck or I just feel more energized about working on A or B, I'll focus my attention there. Uh, now, if you're on deadline with one piece, you can't really use that. But I do try to have a couple things going on at the same time. So whatever I'm more interested in, I can pour my energy into because I always find uh, the more enthusiasm you can have about what you're working on, the better it's, it's going to be. Mm -hmm. So if I'm really not enthused about working on a particular piece, I might just avoid it for a day or two. And then, and then magically, you might come up with some solution presents itself. And uh, it's funny how that works sometimes, but that's sort of how I, I tackle those, those situations when they arise. Do you I'll guys tell you have... another thing too, if I can, Jeff. Um, uh, Travis just reminded me of something. I, I've had times when I've been covering a baseball game, a playoff game or something like that. And I may have a couple of different things that I've, that I have to get done. And it seems like, you know, the deadlines are piling up and, and uh, I'm getting a little frustrated with things. I sometimes have to take a deep breath and say, you know, Hey, I'm writing about baseball. I am here, you know, in this moment at a place where so many people would love to be. Um, it's, it's not so bad after all. And just, you know, one little calming, you know, a minute or something like that can sometimes do wonders to kind of refocus you on what you, uh, what you're working on. Do you guys yeah. have big boards? Do you have like l big lists of topics that you want to write about someday? Uh, how, how do you d generate topics? It's, I have a list on my phone. Okay. <laughs> on the notes. Yeah. Yeah. If I have, if I lose this phone, it's on the cloud. I'm in big trouble. But yeah, I, uh, I don't have a, maybe I should get a whiteboard, have a, have a war room with ideas and, you know, but yeah, I use my phone and I just write down, uh, ideas I'm thinking about or something occurs. It's just amazing what'll pop into your head. So I'll just put it down and I'll go through the list and, uh, I try to, get to as many as I can and execute the good ones. Uh, so yeah, I think you know, writing, whether it's a goal or a story idea, uh, to have it written down and to have a list is always helpful to, to go back and revisit and check progress. So uh, yeah, I do have a whiteboard of sorts. Yep, I, I have a Word doc that uh, things that I want to write about or points that I want to make. Um, I also keep kind of like an archive of things that I've written um, for each for instance, the Sports Weekly column that I've been writing for, for many years now, kind of a, an archive of what topics that I've used in case maybe I want to update something, maybe I want to go back. If, if I'm looking for uh, an idea, I have no idea what to write about this, you know, this particular week, I can go back and say, well, what worked uh, or what didn't work that I've, that I've written about in the past? Sometimes that will um, you know, kind of kick in some new ideas that uh, you know you want to revisit or you want to uh, take a different uh, different tact on. So yeah, it, it's good to have a, a place, uh, a clearinghouse where where you can go to um, if you run into you know that that type of situation. Do you find yourself consuming more? or less than you did in the past with the written word uh, because we have so many 
podcasts, so many videos, so many streaming opportunities. Uh, I found that I'm doing my reading online too much, uh, that I just don't sit down and read a book. And I feel like that actually hurts me as a writer sometimes, too. I think it's a different style that we're consuming. Do you guys run into that at all? Is that a concern? Uh, yeah, I mean, for sure. And, you know, my, you know, I love my kids, but they, so I'm also at a place in life where I don't have the uh, leisure reading time that I did. Yeah. How old are your kids? Uh, uh, four and nine. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So it's a fun, it's their fun ages, but they're mm -hmm. also ages where they need a lot of attention. So a lot of that leisure reading time that I used to build into my day uh, is gone for the, for, for the most part. Yeah. And I'm probably also guilty of spending too much time on, you know, X and or Twitter. Uh, so yeah, that's something, one of these new year's resolutions, it's going to be to, to, to uh, create a list or a, some reachable goals again and get back to it because I still, uh, you know, I, I do want to build up the, uh, the leisure reading. It's a good muscle to keep always working on. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm definitely guilty of not being in the place where I'd, where I'd like to be on that. Absolutely. For me, um, I don't, once, once the laptop from work, you could take home and you didn't have to leave your, your desktop at the office and, and come home and, and have, you know, uh, uh, and get untethered to all those work responsibilities. Um, that was, that was a huge, that was the point where my, my reading of, of actual books and, you know, my sports illustrated subscription, you know, it was about then when I had to say, Meh, I don't have time to read all of this because I'm spending so much time online. Um, sad, but true. I, I think, yes, uh, that's, that's kind of the experience a lot of people have. And I think one of the things that's, that's good though, is that we can take podcasts with us when we go out on our walk, um, you know, walk the dog, take the, uh, you know, the headphones with us. Absolutely. Um, I think that, that does help. And that's one where, you know, you don't have to sit there with your nose in the book or, you know, your face glued to the screen. Um, you can go in and kind of get some fresh air, but still get that thirst for knowledge quenched um, in, in different ways. I've listened to many of wire podcasts walking on. Absolutely. Walking around, yep. <laughs> walk around the neighborhood. Yeah. Same here. Absolutely. And I, I listen to plenty of podcasts. I, I can't, and that's my other problem is I'm overwhelmed. There's so many good podcasters out there now that I, I can't possibly keep up. And yes, we walk the dog every day. Uh, I get the morning walk. My wife usually gets the evening walk. Um, sometimes it you fix, fix another one in there too, but mm -hmm. there are sometimes I just want to unplug. I don't want to even hear baseball. I don't want to hear anything there. And that makes it a little, you know, sometimes that's when I get my better ideas actually is when I'm not listening to something. Yeah, although I have to say, when I listen to podcasts sometimes, and there are comments on there that I disagree with, um, that's a great resource for getting ideas, too, because if, if something motivates you to say, that's not right, you know, what are they talking about? Um, it gives you something, you know, that goes on the list, you know, when I get back. Uh, people trying to get involved that are trying to write for the first time or they've been going for just a little bit, what are some tips you'd give them to try to improve their writing? Yeah, I would say um, try to write every day, whether you have a, you know, ideally you have a paid position, but those can be tough to come by coming out of school or being young in the field. So whether it's your own, you know, medium or whatever platform you want to use just to get in the habit of doing it every day, because that's, the only way to really, uh, there's no shortcut to getting an experience going through it. And uh, like with any other skill-based work, it really comes down to time spent and going through that process. So I would, uh, that's one thing that helped me, even though I didn't start out writing about Major League Baseball, I started out writing every day at a small newspaper. And that was what, uh, you, you learn a lot, especially in those first few years about what works, what doesn't. Uh, so yeah, that to me, that's step one, just right. Yeah, I, I think for me, it's try to do as many different things as you can and acquire, you know, a broad range of skills, whether it's, you know, social media, um, you know, if you do podcasting, writing, uh, there's, I think that's one of the ways that I've been able to kind of stick around at USA Today for as, as long as I have as the, the, 
the industry has changed so have my responsibilities and being open to learning new things i mean you know we can i'm sure we can remember when when statcast was first introduced and there are a whole new set of stats it's very overwhelming and i think for anybody starting out it's overwhelming with everything that's going on um but just dip your toe in see you know what you can understand and i think one of the things for me is I've, I've tried to do that. I, I don't know that I've specialized. I, I can't, for instance, you know, delve into the, the pitching uh, mechanics, you know, like, like Eno Saris does, uh, like Nick Pollock, um, those guys. I don't know that I can, you know, go into the deep analysis, you know, to, to the depths that, that Travis does and some others into, into data um, or, or auction strategies like Ariel Cohen earlier today here on uh, on PitchCon. But being able to be fluent in all those types of languages and being able to, to carry on a conversation and at least know what people are talking about, um, having that base of knowledge, I think, does help a lot. And if you find something that you can specialize in that you know maybe better than a lot of people, um, then you can focus on that maybe you can find your niche you know if it's mlb depth charts you know or or something closers or bullpens or or anything like that there are so many different areas that people are looking for uh folks who have that kind of expertise so start out maybe broad range and then if there's something that really really interests you you know delve in and 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 see what you can learn yeah, I think that point on finding a, a niche is huge. If you can find something that isn't, uh, it's harder now because I think a lot of the low hanging fruit and mm -hmm. whether it's fantasy analysis or regular baseball analysis has been uh, been harvested a long time ago. But if you can find something that is overlooked or no one's done many deep dives on, that's a great place to start too to try to get a foothold somewhere. And then you can, uh, maybe it's recurring where you can keep revisiting it or it leads to something else. So I think mastery in a, you know, I think writing is every, every day is important too, but also finding a niche, something, how do you differentiate yourself? Because there's so many voices and there's so many media options. It's a, uh, it's a tall task, but if you can find something that's different, that's, that can be huge. Yeah. And the tricky part too, is like, you want to find uh, inspiration. You want to consume as much as you can, but at the same time, you want to make something that's yours. And I always struggle with that. Like I, I, I want to read everything that's been done by all of our great colleagues, but I also want to do my own stuff. I, I don't want to like <laughs> take their stuff, you know, I, and maybe you can be inspired by that and you have to go ask your ask more questions and follow on that, but you run the risk of, you know, it's like, we always, we always saw like, there's an episode on South park. Simpsons did it. Simpsons did it. Like <laughs> every, everything has been done. I feel like sometimes, and that's something that that is a, a wall that I run into sometimes. Yeah. Well, you mentioned ask, uh, asking the right questions, Jeff, I think that's, that's huge. And some of the stories and projects I'm most proud of all, they all start with a, a question. Can you, yep. and, can, and once you have the right question, then you can go in search of, okay, how do I find the answers? Are the answers interesting? And if you're learning something along the way, that's probably a good sign because you haven't read it or you haven't, you know, found it elsewhere. So I think, uh, you know, if you're struggling or but if you can, if there's something that pops into your head, what, oh, I wonder what this is. I mean, that's probably a good place to start if uh, finding the answers to those questions you find interesting. That's that's a great point. And I'll tell you kind of maybe a, a personal experience. Um, ask, when you ask questions, don't be afraid to do that. Um, and sometimes you're gonna be, you're gonna be embarrassed by the questions that you ask because you don't have this, you know, a, as much knowledge. Um, but I will, I will say, uh, back when uh, I was working in radio, this is a long time ago, um, I was covering college basketball, and it was a University of Virginia versus NC State basketball game, and Jim Valvano was the coach at NC State, and there was a play at the end of the game where um, they were coming out of a timeout, and at that time, the referees were instructed to put the basketball down on the floor if the teams have not come out at a reasonable time from the huddle. And so he did that at this game, at the end of this game, and started doing the five second count. And NC State ended up turning the ball over. Virginia got the ball, went in for the game winning basket. And all of these people 
at the end of the game, we're asking Jim Valvano about the, the rules and everything like that. And I was on deadline for radio and I had to get uh, something about the game filed. And I needed to have a quote about the game itself. And I, and I, I held my hand up and finally got a chance to ask a question. And I was like, well, did you feel like your team played well enough to win? And he stopped and looked at me, you know, and I'm feeling like needles all on my, on my face and my, and, and everything. And I'm getting really, really hot. He's like, were you at the game? Or was you outside somewhere? (laughs) And I'm like, Oh God. And, and, but then he went on to answer the question and give me like the perfect 14 second sound bite or whatever. Nice. And I ran out of there as fast as I could. You know, I, I'm sure that a lot of people felt like because I was embarrassed, which I was, but then when I was playing the tape back, he gave me exactly what I needed and I was able to get that in. So it, it was, it was terrible. Uh, it was a terrible feeling, but if you can get past the point where you know that you don't know everything, ask questions, don't be afraid. If sometimes, you know, like that reporter the other day um, in Tampa Bay was talking, you know, asked a question about the weather in Detroit, you know, when they're playing in a dome stadium, I don't, it's, it's, it's a horrible situation. I don't know what the background on that was. It could be that that questioner wasn't a sports reporter at all and didn't have that background information. But nevertheless, you know, you've got to, those things are going to happen uh, if you're at it for a long enough period of time. And sometimes they can lead to exactly what you want. Sometimes they can just be stories later on that you're embarrassed to tell, but say, yeah, look, look how I've uh, improved. You know, things have gotten so much better from there. Um, but don't be afraid to, to ask questions, I guess, is, <laughs> is, uh, is my experience. That's how I learn. That's great. Uh... I mean, one example I guess I would have, and this is way back when I was in the Pirate Speed, probably 10 years ago or so now. Uh, wow, we're all getting old. Uh, <laughs> so the Pirates, said, I think it was 2013 or 2014, they'd acquired Marlon Bird at the deadline. And this was pre stackcast so we didn't have launch angles and that sort of thing. And he was under the uh, – he had had this power resurgence, and he was under – he had tested positive for uh, – you know, steroid use a year or two before. So he's under this cloud of suspicion. And oh, how's this? How did Marlon Bird hit all these home runs? And I noticed fan graphs tracked, you know, ground ball, fly ball. And he'd made this dramatic uh, change in how he, he became a ground ball hitter. I mean, he became a fly ball hitter after having pronounced ground ball tendencies his whole career, going back to his minor league days. And I, uh, I thought that was really interesting. I thought, oh, guys are just naturally ground ball hitters or they're fly ball hitters. They've been swinging one way since they're amateurs and they, mm-hmm. you know, all the uh, muscle memory and uh, their neural neural nets in their, their brain had hardwired this in and it was hard to change, but he'd done it like over the course of one off season. So I was curious, I'm like, how did he do that? And I went to ask him and he told me about how he went and worked with this instructor, in sort of the storage unit of a facility in LA, Doug Lotta, and uh, how he changed his swing and became he went away from all the traditional teachings of, you know, hit the ball hard up the middle. Now he's going to try to pull the ball in the air. And that, that one question led to, <clears throat> excuse me, one interesting story, but I also pursued that. Like I've, I've written about the fly ball tendencies many times over those following years. And it led to portions of reporting in a book too. So there's, that's just one example I come back to of, uh, that was interesting. Well, let me go find the answer. No, no, that's even more interesting. That leads to this and this and this. And then it helped that, ball tracking and stack has came out too but yeah so if you get those interesting uh thoughts or questions that pop up pursue them i mean i still kick myself sometimes when i i'll see someone else reports a really great piece and mm-hmm. it clearly started with a question that like like i might have observed the same thing happen in the game or but i didn't didn't i didn't think to pursue it so <laughs> always if something interesting or you see something or hear something pursue it because it'll probably interest other people too yeah, the was whole that process... before um, he got busted for steroids too, though? I think that was, uh, I think it was after he'd served a suspension. I okay. need to go, I can't remember the exact timeline, but I think, I believe it was playing out under the cloud where he must be juicing again or, or something along that. But it, And maybe who knows what he was doing, but he clearly made a, but, yeah. the swing path had changed and his approach had changed. 
That's that's cool. You know, I, I think it's funny. The whole process here is, you know, completely different than what we were taught in law school, where you're like, you're taught never ask a question you don't already know the answer to. <laughs> here it's the exact opposite. You're trying to find out and don't have these preconceived notions. You're trying to be inquisitive and trying to find out new information. I think it's a completely different skill set there. And that's, that's kind of interesting. And to Steve's point, some you have to risk uh, looking foolish at times too. Yeah. Whether you're asking a question in a press conference or whether you're writing something that uh, you know you'll get dunked on or, or whatnot in the comment section. I mean, you have to be, uh, and I think that's something you build a thicker skin over times too. But you have to be sure. comfortable with looking like a moron at times. And one other two, one other thing too, um, ask people who to ask. You know, if they don't give you a good answer. Um, you know, one of my favorite things, if I go into a clubhouse, um, is to ask, you know, one of the players, you know, who's the most sabermetrically inclined player on the team, you know, or, or who, who looks at the stat cast metrics the most. And then if they tell me somebody that I haven't interviewed yet, I'm like, oh, okay, well, there's a nice lead. I can go in if I want to ask a stat cast related question or, uh, you know, something analytically oriented, then, I can, you know, ask that person, you know, seek that person out to maybe get a uh, an answer to the question I want. Yeah, certainly. I mean, having the, I mean, this could go, this is probably a whole nother uh, session, but just the human network as a reporter to people to ask questions of or find, get information from, it's so important to build, build that up. Uh, yeah. So it never asking questions of, of humans too is <laughs> a is a very useful uh, skill to have. When you're reading other writing, you you can see like some writers are stronger than others. What to you defines like what's a really good who's what what makes this a, this person a really good writer? This one's just an okay writer. Hmm. I, I think for me, it's it's somebody who makes you think, um, who challenges maybe some preconceived notions that you have. Um, I think that's why, for instance, Bill James was so much of a of a factor uh, when he first started writing is because he challenged, you know, things that were believed to be true by everybody and said, well, wait a minute, that that those sorts of things um, that make me say, oh, that I, I didn't really realize that or uh, that's a different way of looking at something. Um, those people. Uh, are the you know those those writers I think are the ones that grab my attention the most. Yeah, I think uh, you know it's unfortunate what's happened to Sports Illustrated. Uh, yeah. But I you know Gary Smith was a writer who when he would have a story I would always uh, be engrossed in them and yep. uh, and he was like there's some writers that might have a, just a natural inclination or ability to write tremendous uh, beautiful prose and whatnot and he certainly could do that but. Uh, I think one of the separators is is how much can you you can tell how well they know a subject, how much they've how much time they've spent with a subject. And he would go and spend, you know, he would only write a handful of stories a year, but he would spend weeks and mm -hmm. uh, with subjects. He would spend months researching, and you can tell. Uh, I think really with anything, but reporting and writing too, you can tell how deeply someone is, uh, how deeply they've reported this or understand the material. And uh, yeah, I think that's that's clear, and I think that's one of the things that that separates writers, and a, a lot of crossover with, with what Steve said too. And people that can make you think differently or challenge, often those are people who've researched it well and thought deeply about it themselves. And I think that that's one of the separators. Yeah, I, and I want to want to shout out some of those. I mean, Joe Sheehan is is fabulous. Um, love his newsletter. Uh, yep. So I'll, I'll throw that out there. And Joe's Joe's a friend of mine too. Um, but Joe Posnanski also does a, a fabulous job of baseball writing. Um, I, I love Will Leach, pretty much anything that he writes. There, there are so many of them. And now I'm going to get myself in a hole here by not mentioning people. But, you know, that sort of those are the sort of of, of uh, people that I like to read and that inspire me and give me ideas um, and, and can do writing so well uh, for, for what I like to read. I, uh, do you have like a type of structure that you like to follow? Do you have, uh, you know, getting into the guts of actually writing, is there, you know, not just the content, but like the structure, the pros, uh, like the, you know, 
is there anything, any tips you want, you should impart to others on, on what works for you? Yeah. I, uh, I mean, I was, as a young writer, I was told to, uh, to go read Ernest Hemingway. This was by a Cleveland uh, sports columnist. I I went to Hal Lebovitz, the late Hal Lebovitz, who's a legend uh, here. And I went to his book signing once and I told him, you know, I was very nervous approaching him, but I asked him, you know, what advice would you give me? And he was like, go read Ernest Hemingway. Don't read sports writers. Go read Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> and he writes very simply because everyone's like, oh, you uh, you're not exactly a young Hemingway or, you know, he's put up on this pedestal as this great author. And he was, but he also wrote very simply, very sparse prose. Every adjective is kind of suspect and what's really necessary, simple sentence structures. And I think, I think there's this idea that to be, you know, a wonderful writer, it's got to be very flowery and you have to have all these adjectives. And, uh, but really you want to boil it down and be very direct, very simple, very a active voice. And that that engages people more, I find. Uh, and again, it goes back to reporting. If you have better details, you don't need to try to add something to it. You just explain what you saw, you explain what you found, and that helps the structure a lot. So I th it's sort of like very generally, it's uh, less is more and simple sentences, short sentences. I That's what I try to lean back on. And uh, you know, I find it effective. Yep, I, I, I'm right with you. And, I, and one of the things too that I, that I notice, if you can introduce something in the beginning of, you know, if it's a column or whatever, um, you can introduce something, maybe ask a question, pose a question or something, and then come back, you know, go through everything, come back around to it at the end. Uh, Tony Kornheiser back in his day of sports writing was wonderful at throwing something out in a lead that you didn't really understand what he was saying, but at the end he would come back around to it and kind of put the, bookend, you know, the brackets on, on the whole thing. Um, it really hits you sometimes. That was a really good column when you kind of, as your reader, figure it out along those lines and say, yep, there it is. You know, that was what was at the beginning. Um, Hemingway does that. I, I remember the, for whom the bell tolls ends in the same sort of place, you know, at the beginning, uh, as it is, you know, where, uh, it's been a while since I read it, but you know the, the the protagonist is like dying in the same place, you know that the book began. That sort of thing, kind of you know make it like a mini story, if if that makes sense. Um, I, I think stylistically that's that's a really effective technique if you can you know if that applies to what you're writing. Uh, you want to uh, when I was working on Big Data Baseball, my first I had never written a book before, and the editor who was working with me. It's like you want to have this element of, yeah. Uh, how do you you want to propel the reader to keep going? So you have to keep leaving these little crumbs, these little surprises, wanting more. Uh, and to a point about Kornheiser style, like whether it's in the lead or the the nut graph or kind of hypothesis of a piece, I'll try to link back. I'll try to link to like three or four elements I'm going to read touch on. So the as the reader goes through, they're like, okay, here's one, here's two. So they know what they're going to mm -hmm. get. But then as you go along, uh, you know, okay, here's the second detail you mentioned. Here's a third. So it'll keep uh, keep propelling them, hopefully, to the piece. So start with this general idea of here's what we're going to touch on and here's the argument. And then you support that through anecdotes, through data, through uh, reporting as you go along. Uh, I don't know if I explained that well, but that's sort of how I, yep. I think about here's the tease. And if you want to keep going, I'm going to give you a little more, a little more, a little more. And the readers feel like they're figuring it out on their own, even if you are dropping those little crumbs and giving, you know, supporting information and things like that. They they come to the conclusion themselves. You don't have to, you know, hit them on over the head with it. Yeah. Uh, and other little things like I try not to stack super long paragraphs on top of each other. Uh, like if, I mean, I write a lot about numbers and data, but I don't want to have just these text blocks full of numbers too. So I try to, those are, I don't want to get into the uh, the weeds too much, but yeah, little things like that, just to help propel. I think about how is the reader experiencing this? What will help propel them through the piece, uh, make it as painless as, as possible. What would you like to see less from, from fantasy writers or sports writers? <laughs> hmm. What, what mistakes are made uh, in the course of sports writing? 
That's a great question. Maybe, Sorry, I didn't maybe outline that for you guys earlier. I just <laughs> thought of it. <laughs> yeah, um, maybe maybe it's just you know trying to do too much at once. Um, you know, taking taking a broad topic and trying to attack it from too many different angles. Um, people people may not be able to consume all of something. You know, a huge article all at once. So, you know, make your points and and get out. I don't know. Maybe that's it. Maybe don't ask an overly broad question at the end of a podcast. I don't know. Maybe that, that's, that's a mistake. And we've come <laughs> full circle, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, it's a good question. I'd like to uh, come back to that next <laughs> next year and have a better answer for you. Uh, 